I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And that's where we're, we're headed this morning. We know, uh, we know that we talk about forgiveness of sins. We talk about being forgiven each and every day for our sins. But more uh, focus in, in general this morning is on the forgiveness of sins that we experience at our salvation. When we come to know Jesus Christ, he's forgiven our, forgiven our sins uh, once and for all eternal, eternally. And you think about the impact of that, just walking through different people's lives. I think of uh, a tribal people who had never heard the good news of Jesus Christ, and they came to hear the good news, understand it, accept God's forgiveness, and their response was unbelievable, joyous worship as they jumped up and down, and they, and they shouted and sang a praise to God for the forgiveness of their sins. I think about a man who uh, came to Christ uh, through tremendous heartache from choices he had made in his life, losing his wife and his children as a result of those choices. And yet, when he came to know Christ and his forgiveness for his sins, he, uh, he found while he was weeping, uh, he wept continually. He wept tears of sorrow for what he had lost because of the choices he had made, but he also wept tears of joy, the wonder that God had forgiven him of his sins and what he had done in his, his past. I think about a woman who, was, who had lived a very promiscuous lifestyle, and she came to know Jesus Christ, and she found uh, peace that she had never known, and she found forgiveness for because of the forgiveness she experienced for all she had done in the past. She, uh, she rejoiced and celebrated and found peace. I mean, the stories go on and on. Each of us here, if you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you can tell that story to others of when you came to know forgiveness of your sins in your, your own life. And it's important for us to remember that. And this morning, we say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. What do we mean by that? What does that look like? And how do we respond in, in our lives, or should we respond, knowing that God has forgiven us by his grace, uh, through the, the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we're just going to look at some different aspects of forgiveness, and we're going to start by saying, what does forgiveness mean? And when we say, what does forgiveness mean? We need to say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And so we probably should start with, what, well, what are sins? And then we'll say, well, we believe in forgiveness of that. And we talk about forgiveness, what are sins? It's, it's a lack of conformity to uh, anything that's a lack of conformity to God's Law and in 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 First John we find um, uh, three sin is uh, uh, lawlessness. That's what it, what it is, and uh, it affects every aspect of our life. It's a perversity that impacts every aspect of our life and affects every single person. None of us are immune. Uh, all of sin falls short of the glory of God. No one say, "Well, I haven't sinned. Uh, I'm good to go." It's sin is is lawlessness, and and what happens is you know it's uh, you live life. It's like a moral minefield. I mean. If we're honest, we know that every single day that we walk, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going to think that anymore. The reality is we just find ourselves so often drawn and pulled to the very things we don't want to do, we do, the Apostle Paul says. And, and so it's a challenge each and every day. To, you know, we, we step that direction, and more often than not, we find maybe it's too late. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have done that. I wish I wouldn't have gone there. wouldn't have said that. Um, we've been there, right? Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah, we're, we're here, so we don't want to, yeah, okay, yeah. But it, we don't want to enthusiastically say that because that would be too excited to say, yeah, I've done that. But the reality is it affects all of us, and, and what, is the, what, is the, what is the fruit of that apart from Christ is the result is the wrath of God in our lives. In Romans 1.18, God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, and that is sin. Now, Fortunately, by the grace of God, there is something called forgiveness. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Praise God for that, huh? You know, and so what does it mean to forgive? It means that we just, we are able to, you know, God gives up basically his, his sword, so to speak. He gives us his right to exact punishment on us for sins. John Stott, uh, an author I appreciate, a former pastor, he said this, forgiveness is pardon in a personal setting. It is taking back into friendship those who went against you, hurt you, put themselves in the wrong with you. It is compassionate, showing unmerited favor or kindness to the wrongdoer, and it is inevitably costly. And God's, God's forgiveness is a supreme example uh, of this. If you think about, can you imagine 
life without forgiveness, that you could not be forgiven of your sin uh, in your life. Can you imagine what that'd be like for the, for the whole of, of the world just going walking around with a guilty conscience that could never be cleansed, never be washed, shame and guilt that never could be be removed from us. We try different ways externally. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to try this, try that. And we always end up empty and in vain of finding that forgiveness because it's not possible aside from what Christ has, has done. And so, you know, forgiveness in, in a sense of God's example is he forgives us for what uh, we, we don't deserve it. He gives it to us unmerited favor. And that's what forgiveness is. And just, here's some aspects. That, one is that the price for our forgiveness has been paid. You need to understand that. And, uh, and God's word reveals that Jesus paid it all. He, when he first came on the scene, John the Baptist said, Behold, what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, there he is right from the start. So what does that mean? Well, they had, used, used to have a sacrificial system. They were to sacrifice an animal to pay for the price of sins. But it was once a year, an annual sacrifice, a day of atonement. But it was just kind of a symbolic. It never really took away the sin. You know, ultimately, and when Jesus came as the Lamb of God, died on the cross for your sin, my sin, our sin was paid for once and for all. Ephesians 1, 7. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his Son and forgave our sins. Talk about God the Father. He, he's so rich in kindness. He's so rich in grace that he, he paid the price for our freedom. That price was the blood of Jesus Christ who forgave our sins. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God made Christ who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so we could be made right with God through Christ. You know, it is so essential that we understand this, uh, this concept because otherwise we're going to strive and spend our lives trying to do that which is impossible. That is to try to find forgiveness through our own efforts. And when we do that, we just end up with just guilt weighing on us, that, that, that unforgiveness weighing on us, that cloud always weighing on our hearts and minds and souls. You know, I'll give you a, an example of this. And um, Pastor, uh, and he's an author, Matt Chandler. I don't know if you've heard of Matt Chandler. It doesn't really matter if you have or haven't. Uh, but he tells a story. He was speaking at a, at a conference in his, uh, or near his, his hometown. And uh, he says this, When I was done preaching, I decided to hop in my car, drive 20 minutes to town, in which I grew up, and look at the houses that I remembered from back then. And as I drove into town, I passed a field where I once got into a fist fight with a kid named Sean. It was not a fair fight, and I did some shady, dark things in that fight. I completely humiliated him in front of a large crowd of people. Then I drove past my first house, and I thought of all the wicked things I had done in that house. I passed by my friend's house where once at a party I did some of the most shameful, horrific things that I had ever done. Afterward, on the drive back to the conference, I was overwhelmed with guilt and shame of the wickedness that I had done in that city prior to knowing Jesus Christ. I could hear the whispers in my heart, you call yourself a man of God. Are you going to stand in front of these guys and tell them to be men of God after all you have done? Have you been there? I mean, I think just this last week I was sharing about a situation in my teen years, and I'm thinking, man, I just, that was a horrible thing that I said. Uh, you know, and just going back home, I have some of the same things. Uh, great memories. Going back to Federal Way, I walk back, back to my folks' house, drive to different places growing up. But there's also the same feeling of Matt Chandler. Man, that was, I remember that. That was not a good place for me. I made some really poor decisions there. Same idea. In the middle of, this is what Challenge says, in the middle of all that guilt and shame, I began to be reminded by the Scriptures that the old Matt Chandler is dead. The Matt Chandler who did those things, the Matt Chandler who sinned in those ways was nailed to the cross, was nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ and all of his sins, past, present, and future, were paid for in full on the cross of Jesus Christ. I no longer need to feel shame for those things because those things have been completely paid for, atoned for. You know, at the foundation of our forgiveness, as most of us know this, but we need to be reminded of it, because even a, a guy who's a pastor and author can come back and be hounded by guilt from is saying, listen, we, we don't need to question, we don't need to doubt, we don't need to wonder. Our sins have been paid for. We have been forgiven because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And just to follow that up, forgiveness is not something, and again, this seems to be such a, I don't know, confusion in our society. Forgiveness cannot be gained, it cannot be earned by what we do in, in our, our lives. 
You know, so often you hear people, and I just uh, talk to people who say, well, you know, if I, my good deeds outweigh my bad. I think I'm going to make it to heaven because of what I've done. I'm not sure, but I think God will forgive me because I've, I've really done some good things. I mean, I hear this. I'm not making this up. These are real conversations that people have. And sometimes maybe you hear today, or I'm not sure. You know, I think, I think I'm a good person. I think God will, will show favor on me. You're trying to base it on works and trying to base it on what you've done or how you've lived or what you haven't done or compared to other people. But the reality is, uh, you know, full acceptance, full forgiveness is, is not possible apart from faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done. Faith only is based on the pardon, what Christ has done. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we have forgiveness. And, and nowhere else can we, can we find that. In our, in, our, in our lives. Psalm 65, verse 3. Though, um, though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. All of them. Colossians 2, 13. You were dead. Uh, Paul writes about the, 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 these Christians. You were dead because of your sins, because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, where he forgave all our sins. You know, it's so critical that we, we grab hold of that, that when we come to Christ, he's paid the price, and not just some of our sins are forgiven, but all. We tend to kind of hang on and say, I know God's forgiven me, but you, you, you know, you've been there, or you know people that are there that think, I, I know, I'm not sure God can forgive me of this. And we don't ever let go of something in our past. We kind of beat ourselves up continually, saying, you know what, he paid for all our sins. He died for all our sins. You forgave them them all on the cross. Our salvation, again, is in grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. And if we miss this point, Christ is our cornerstone, as we sang earlier. If we miss that, then we're going to try somehow to seek to work out our own salvation, to pay the price. I want to show you a clip from a movie. It's called uh, Get Low. I don't normally recommend movies, but just this is a scene that uh, is uh, worth watching, kind of gives us this idea of someone and that maybe doesn't grasp this, uh, this concept. Buddy? Oh. What can I do for you, sir? That's all right, come on in. Have a seat. <coughs> What's on your mind, sir? It's, uh, about time for me to get low. To get what? Down to business. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I need a funeral. For whom? <sighs> me. For you? You want to buy a funeral for you? Am I not talking right? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Are you sick? Everybody dies. All right. I see. Well, sir, the church can help you get your affairs in order and arrange a service for you. Well, what would you say? About what? Me. Oh, oh, uh, eulogy. Well, I don't know. What do you want me to say? Say what you say right now to my face. Mr. Bush, I don't know much about you. I've heard stories, but... What stories? Just stories, you know. People talking. What kind of stories? I mean, second one. <laughs> well, sir, my mother used to say that gossip is the devil's radio. Uh -huh. What matters is that when you come to the end of your life, that you're ready for the next one. Now, have you made peace with God, sir? I paid. Well, Mr. Bush, you can't buy forgiveness. It's free, but you do have to ask for it. Oh my God, that's great. 
This man somehow thought, maybe I can buy forgiveness. I'm going to walk in. Uh, he's paid. He's paid as you watch it. He's paid through his life and basically spent a life doing, doing a penance. But the reality is, as you know, most of you know, if you don't know, there's only one way we can find forgiveness, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ and what he paid for on the cross. Uh, we've done this before, but I want to do it again. Uh, is sing a song, very simple. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm going to sing the the little first line, you're going to sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm going to sing the second line, you're going to sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. We're going to sing the chorus together. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. There we go. So can I join that? Be a little more enthusiastic, all right? <laughs> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. The blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Not of good that I have done. Oh, <coughs> of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood <coughs> of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood <clears throat> This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Forgiveness cannot be bought. It cannot be bought. It is only the way we find forgiveness is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we, if we forget that, we try to go on our own. And so often, I think we, be, we need to be reminded and brought back to this. You know, one, the other thing about forgiveness is amazing. It's, it's unlimited in, in its nature. It has, uh, God says, if we confess our sins our, to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness or all uh, unrighteousness. In, in Psalm 103, verse 12, he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's how far he's removed our sin. Now, I brought a globe here today. I had never thought about this in preparing this week. It, it was pretty fascinating to me. You know, when you think about a globe, he says he's removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. Now, you can't see it here, but, and I can hardly see it, frankly. But, uh, you know, right here is Junction City, Oregon. There it is, right there. You see that? All right, there you go. There we are, Junction City. It's amazing they put it on a globe. They put Junction City. It's pretty cool. And so, uh, you know what? But if you go, if you go head, let's head north from Junction City, you end up where? North Pole. Yeah, and if you keep going, you keep going and keep going, and you go all the way down, you're heading, eventually you're heading what direction? South, and you end up at the South Pole. Now, if you go in Junction City, no, I'm in France now, what happened here? Okay, here we go. Now, if you're in Junction City and you start heading east, and you're heading east, and you're heading east, and you're heading east, and you go, oh, man, now we're, now we're in France, you know? And we're still heading east. We're going across wonderful Russia and those kinds of places. Well, we're down a little further south. But, yeah, we're in China, okay? And so we go across the ocean. We come back to Jackson City. We're still heading which direction? We're still heading east. We never run into west. We never start going west. You head north. You start. You eventually keep going around. You go south. And you're heading north. And you're heading south. But if you're heading from Junction City east, you keep going east, 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 east. You never stop going east. 
You never stop going west, you go the other direction. He removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. Didn't say from the north or south, because there'd be a stopping point. He says, no, as far as the east is from the west, he removes our sin. Is that awesome? Yes, it is. That is awesome. I'll add, that wasn't a rhetorical question. That's amazing. I just never really, never really grabbed that. I thought, that is so cool. Our, our sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. You know, the results of God's forgiveness, here's just some, some things to think about. And these first two just go hand in hand. Uh, one is that we have, uh, you know, if we understand God's forgiveness, we have peace within. Remember, I talked about that woman at the beginning, how she just knew forgiveness, she knew peace that she had never known before. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what? Christ, Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. It is a peace within, it's a peace with God. You think about the first, the peace within that we have, when you know you are forgiven, there is a peace that surpasses all understanding, truly, as Philippians 4 talks about when we pray, that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I remember uh, some, some time ago, it's been quite a while, Julie came in and shared with us, so she was like, I don't know, Julie's 70s, I think, maybe, and she came and shared how she had just recently come, at that point, to understand the forgiveness of God. And over an issue in her life, when she was a teenager, she had an abortion. I don't know if you were here for that Sunday, but she said, you know, all these years I've been troubled with guilt and shame. And until very recently, she says, I never understood the forgiveness that God had given me. And she said, I have peace that I've never known. Years and years, 50 plus years of wrestling with guilt and shame. And she found forgiveness. No condemnation in Christ Jesus, peace with God. And that's the second thing that happens. Not only do we have a peace within in, in, in our lives, and maybe, maybe some of you are right there. You've wrestled with, with guilt or shame for years, and you just had this cloud over you for what you have done. You're failing to understand the peace that God offers you through forgiveness, and he wants you to have that. And when you understand that, you go, wow, burden lifted. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Because Jesus played it all. What washed away my sin? Jesus' blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's not anything I've done. And man, there's nothing like that. Really, nothing like that. If you're there today, you need to understand the glorious good news that Jesus has forgiven your sin. You can have peace with him because he's taken as far as the east is from the, from the west. And here's the other thing that happens. We have peace with God. Not only have peace with him, we have, we have peace with God because of what Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord has uh, has done for us. I mean, that's a, a restored, a renewed relationship. And you think about when in uh, Matthew 27, I think I put this up, did I put that up? Yes. At the moment, at Christ's death, it's at the moment that curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart. Talks about this later on in Hebrews. You're going, what? what's with this curtain? I don't understand. Well, there's a curtain that separated the, the ordinary people from really connecting with God and seemed like in that time. And so they couldn't go in, enter God's presence. And, and because of the Holy of Holies, they couldn't go in. We couldn't go in. But when, when Jesus died on the cross, sin was paid, the, the veil was torn, it was all open to everybody. We all had direct access to God. Don't need to go through anybody else. We can go directly to God and have the, a relationship restored. It was, our sin was a barrier between us and God, and the barrier was torn down, opened up, wide open because of uh, his forgiveness through Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, it's, he, he offers it. He offers us to, have, to come to know him. He offers his forgiveness. And the challenge for us is to say, I, I need that. I, I, need, I repent and I come back to you. The classic example would be the prodigal son. He goes away and does his own thing. And God wants a relationship. God wants to forgive. And the prodigal son comes back. What, remember, he says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to repent. And I'll say, I'll just, be a, I'll just be a servant. That's all. Just let me be one of your servants. And when he comes back, when he comes back to the God the Father, what's God the Father's looking? And God the Father runs to him. And he says, hey, you know, that's the picture we have of God. It, it, he runs and he says, you know, hey, we're going to celebrate. The, the one who's lost has been found. He's gone wayward. I don't deserve this. We don't, none of us deserve it. If we think we deserve it, we're missing it. What a wonder it is that he's waiting. And when we come to him, he's saying, man, you are, you are forgiven. Uh, you know, here's the, here's the thing. He offers this. The, the challenge for us is to say, am I accepting, the question for us, am I accepting the forgiveness he offers? Or am I hanging on to something I've done in the past, beating myself up over it, thinking he can't forgive me for what I've done? 
you, you got to understand, he paid it all, died for all. You know, that's, that's the challenge. I keep saying that over and over again because somehow people miss it. And if we miss it, we're relying on works. What a wonder it is. So decide to accept the forgiveness he's offered. So that's uh, peace within, peace with God. Another thing is just what I'd say was joyful uh, and, I put, and reverent worship. Think, well, that's kind of a weird combination. But there's a, there's a part of us that when we come to understand the forgiveness of God, we say, man, he, I just, I'm so overwhelmed with joy. And there's the other part of it, just, you just want to fall on your face and just cry. I can't believe he'd forgive me for what I've done, for who I am. Psalm 130, 3 to 4. It says, Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive, implying no one? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear, to revere, to honor you. There's that there's a idea of fear is revering and honoring God because you, you know, you, you, Forgive us. And what a wonder, what a wonder that is. One of the, one of the great examples of worship from that is you know, the fearing, revering, honoring God's worship is uh, the woman who comes in in, in Luke chapter 7 and her story. If you remember, Jesus at a, at the home of a Pharisee and he, and he had Jesus over for dinner and they sit down a certain, it says in verse 37, a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. She knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had been invited to him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied, thinking, well, you know, he didn't know what's going on in my head, but Jesus actually does. And Jesus tells him the story. A man loaned, uh, loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to another, but neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said, Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only love a little love. Then Jesus says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. You know, I read that account, and I think about how when we understand our sins are forgiven, it should just result in worship, in thankfulness, in reverence. Here's this woman weeping when she's worshiping. And a question, you know, I think we need to ask ourselves is what, what would Jesus say about us and our response to our forgiveness? Would he say, man, you love a lot, or would you love a little? Do you really grab what you've been forgiven of? Or do you just think, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person and God forgave me. Good thing I'm on his team. He's lucky for that. Um, or would he say, man, you know, uh, you know they, they, they get it. They're humbled and they, they get it. It's important for us to ask, ask that. You know, we, we, opened, we opened our time with uh, talking about stories of people who came to understand forgiveness of Jesus Christ and how they responded when they were forgiven and understanding that, you know, the you know, the delete button was pushed on their sin or the, erase, the whiteboard was wiped off. However you want to view it, people came to understand that and that they were right with God, forgiven, and they had peace within, and they worshiped. You know, the challenge for us is, how do I respond to, uh, to knowing that I'm forgiven? How do I respond to that in my life? And the first thing is, again, I go back and say, we need to worship God. We need to just praise God. He has forgiven me. Hallelujah. I mean, just unbelievable that he has forgiven me. Second is to say, you know what? If there's something that's a barrier between me and God right now, is to know that I can and I need to and should go to him and say, God, forgive me of the sins that I have, ha have done, have participated in, have thought in, in my life, in my actions, in different ways. Um, you, know, it's, uh, you know, Isaiah 59 tells us our sins are a barrier between, between us and, and separates from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. He will not hear. God, God hears, but our sin is a barrier. And he just said, I'm not, 
you know, I'm, I'm not really interested in work with them right now because they're not, they're not following me. They're not walking with me. They're disobeying me in that way. You know, we go back to 1 John. We talked about that earlier. If you confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, you know what? Sometimes we find ourselves distant from God. I've been there. You've been there. You think, how did I get here? It's so often it's because we're not doing what God wants us to do, and we won't come to him in repentance and say, God, please forgive me for what I've done, and experience his, his cleansing and his washing in that way. One of my favorite passages I'd like to go back to is Acts 3, 19 and 20. Now repent, uh, turn away from your sins, and turn to God. You, repenting is not just saying, I'm sorry, it's going the other direction, or turning back to God, so that your sins may be wiped away, washed away, delete button pushed, whatever. Then what will happen is times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. I just love that verse, those verses, because it's just, you know, sometimes you're in despair and thinking, man, I got to come back, and I repent, and I turn back to God, and I find times of refreshment. How desperately, I think, as Christians, we need that refreshment today. We're just kind of going through the motions so often. You know, here's, here's the last challenge, and I really wanted to spend the bulk of our time just rejoicing in that God's forgiven us. But one of the natural responses should be in our lives, when we understand God's forgiven us, is that we in turn forgive those around us who have maybe wronged us in our lives. Um, scripture talks about this, Colossians 3, just a couple examples. Make allowance uh, for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Not optional, not optional uh, equipment here. Uh, we'll go down to another passage here we have in Ephesians 4. We looked at this recently. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Again, why? Just as God has, God through Christ has forgiven, forgiven you. An unwillingness to forgive others is a, is a barrier between us and God. And, and it creates problems in a community. It creates problems in a family. It creates problems in a, in a church and division. When we say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, it's not just, well, hallelujah, he's forgiven me. It's that we can dispense forgiveness to others who have wronged us. And we're expected to do that. There's not excuses or exceptions or rationalizations made. It says, this is the challenge. This is the challenge for us as Christians. Say, you know what? God's forgiven me, and we can't just celebrate that and then, and then turn and not forgive others. That's a challenge we're given. Here's, here's an application. If you walk through these doors today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're saying, you know, I go to church, I'm a good person, I'm nice, all those things, and some of this has kind of hit home uh, in, in maybe some of your thinking, I cannot urge you enough to understand that God has forgiven you through Christ. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. It's not something you can do. You know, in, when the apostle, apostles came to the Jews, they didn't get this. They didn't understand this, and they didn't submit to God's righteousness. Paul writes in Romans 10, verse 2. He says, I know what enthusiasm these, the Jews had for God, but it is misdirected zeal, for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way... Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. The challenge for us is to, to understand, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, understand, which is hard for us, that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. I mean, we've we got we to come to grips with that. We, we have a hard time admitting that. We have a hard time saying, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. I need a Savior. You know, an um, example I came across is a, 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 a granddaughter, her grandfather. She, uh, she was a new Christian. Her grandfather was this guy who, was, when he was sober, was a great guy. He was funny. He told great stories. And he was kind. People liked being around. But when he wasn't sober, he was not a nice guy. He was a womanizer, and he was mean, and, and he took over his life and, and really messed up his family. And late in his life, he contracted, uh, he was a coal miner. He, he, he got disease from the coal mining, and he also had a liver problems because of his drinking. And he's, he's going to die very soon. And this granddaughter goes to him, and she says, you know, Grandpa, I, I want to share with you uh, about how you can come to know Jesus Christ and how he's paid the price for your sin and, and your life. And she outlines the message of the gospel. 
And, and the grandfather politely, politely listens, and then he says, you know, I don't, I don't think I can ever think of a time that I, I ever sinned. And she's like taken back by that. She's like, what are you talking about? Can't you think of, uh, of one time, just one thing in your life that you, you did that was wrong? And he kind of plays along, and acts like he's thinking for a minute, and he goes, you know, I, I take that back. I did sin once. I voted for a Republican. You know? I mean, the guy didn't get it. He's joking about eternity. He said, well, yeah, I sinned once, you know, and this is the way it was. Not understanding that he, he, he was a sinner in need of a Savior. You know, Romans tells us, for all have sinned, all, again, word again, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death or eternal separation from God, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It tells us in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet, we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, eternally forgiven, washed clean, the wonder of that. You know, if you've never made that decision, I got to tell you, there's no greater, no more important decision you can make in your life and say, I, I always thought I was just a good person. Not good enough. Stand before the throne of God, he's going to say, well, I should let you in my kingdom. And you, you, the answer is, because I believe Jesus Christ died for my sin and I've accepted him as my savior. That's the answer. Uh, that, I'll give the, the quiz, I'll, I'll give the answer to the quiz ahead of time, okay? You know it. That's it, nothing else. Not, you know, I was a good person, you know, I was a good dad, you know, I did that, I worked hard, you know, I gave money. No, that's not it. So if there's anyone here today, I'd urge you to pray. Pray, God, forgive me for my sins. And I trust to know from what I've heard that you're going to forgive me and cleanse me, wash from all unrighteousness, and I'm going to have a relationship with you, and I'm going to experience peace within. For those of us who have done that, which is probably most of all of us here in this room, it's the reminder of that. A reminder that God is just as he's reconciled us with him, we're called to be reconcilers and go out and share this good news with others so that they too can experience the wonder of forgiveness of Jesus Christ. May we, may we carry that out as believers. May we know his forgiveness. May if you're an unbeliever here today, if not a follower of Jesus Christ, I pray that God's Spirit has put it on you to make that decision. And if not, and you want more information, you want to talk to somebody, man, call me. Grab Rob, grab Troy, grab a leader, uh, grab some folks that were up here singing, say, I don't know these people, but they'll, they'll be able to tell you the good news of Jesus and what he's done in your life, in their life. So that's our hope, that's our longing, that's our prayer. Let's pray, and we can sing a, oh, it's going to be awesome. Let's pray. Lord, today we say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And what a wonder that is. We thank you for what all that means, that you paid it and you paid it all. For us on the cross, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And for that, we thank you and we praise you. We pray that we would know your forgiveness, not rely on our own works, not on what we've done, trying to earn it. We would just rest in, bask in the wonder of your forgiveness. And Lord, we would in turn forgive others who have wronged us because you have forgiven us. I pray for anyone here in this room who has never made a decision to follow you, realizing their need, their desperate need, to ask for forgiveness for you and realize that's the only thing, that's the only way they'll have forgiveness of sins and spend eternity with you. So Lord, just right now, in the quietness of our hearts, we cry out to you, we pray to you, we thank you, we worship you. Just as God has um, convicted you today, just take time just in the quietness of your own heart to uh, respond as, uh, as, as led by the Holy Spirit. Just you and God for just in silence just for a moment. Lord, this day we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. And as you've reconciled our relationship with you, may we be reconcilers for others and tell them the good news uh, about Jesus. And Lord, if there's one here today that has surrendered their life to you, uh, we know that uh, you tell us the angels in heaven rejoice. May we rejoice with them as they share that good news with, uh, with us here today. We thank you and praise you in your name. Amen. Amen.